welcome to Culture Vultures. I'm Sandy Fry, your host. Our creative director is Nancy Cole, and this is a program that examines arts and culture in Tampa and around Tampa Bay. Nine years ago, a very original and creative program started in Tampa. It was part of the Public Art Committee work and was created by the manager of public arts for Tampa, Robin Nye, who is one of our guests today. Each year, beginning from 2003, a photographer selected by a juried committee was commissioned to spend that year in Tampa photographing with the emphasis on what it was like to be in Tampa at that particular point in time. The results range from a video to the black and white photos of the 2012 Photographer Laureate, as the program is called, and as his title is, Rick Savitt, who has chosen black and white photography to tell his story or create what impressions he has of living in Tampa during this time. And he's our second guest today, and I'm welcoming you both. We're very pleased you're here. And the project sounds marvelous. And it's original. It's your creation, isn't it? Yes, it is, yeah. That's, that's terrific. And that's just one. You have a second creation, which is Lights on Tampa Bay. Yes. Well, let's start with the Photographer Laureate. How did it occur to you? I uh, have an art history background, and I received a lot of uh, requests within city government for images from the Burgett Brothers collection for offices and that type of thing for uh, some of the city open spaces. And it occurred to me that there was a lot of things that were happening now that were undocumented, that there was really nothing like that that was happening now, where one could really turn in. There was no archive of contemporary images. So I looked at the Roy Stryker, who actually managed the WPA program, the Work Progress Administration program, uh, in the 1930s and 40s, and kind of modeled the program with how he had assigned artists and, and tried to look at um, some of the issues that he faced and, and put that into a scope of services so that we could commission an artist a year to do something like that. And you chose uh, to have it simply in the city. Of course, the city's uh, boundaries have expanded tremendously since the, um, the Burgett Brothers. And by the way, for those of you who may have heard of the name Burgett Brothers, uh, they were professional photographers who in 1899 opened an office in Ybor City, and they were at work until the early 1960s. And during that time, they and their staff produced 80,000 photographs, which is uh, almost in, uh, too much to try and envision. But it was very good work. Some of it appeared in Life. Some of it appeared in National Geographic. Some of it came in local newspapers, in brochures, and advertisements, and so forth. When they finally retired, their collection was stored in a garage with a tin roof, and heat and uh, moisture and dirt began to destroy some of the images. In 1974, the Friends of the Library were very aware of the fact that this was a unique historical collection, and they raised the funds to buy it. And now we are, we are in a totally different age of photography. Mm -hmm. which, which is, artistically speaking, um, fascinating because uh, technology has uh, done so many things that provide instruments for the artist to use. And Rick, you have a tremendously varied background and so much experience that I think you probably brought to bear in, in so many instances. Tell us a little about what you've done in your life. Well, without being long-winded, <laughs> um, uh, I was a psychology major in college, mm -hmm. kind of a pre-med dropout, and I got more interested in social things. That's where my interests lied. And went in the Peace Corps after that to the Philippines and lived there two years in long before internet and everything. So it was a very uh, solo experience, you know. So, all alone there. In Were the you jungle. the only Peace Corps worker? There? Not well in my village. Mm -hmm. And at that time, yeah. to get see me, see another one, you might have to go three hours on a bus, and there's no phones. So unless you were in a city, if you were in a remote area, you're basically living by yourself. And mm -hmm. 
Uh, you get to learn a lot about yourself and the culture and, and everything. And uh, after the Peace Corps, I came home. Uh, I was in seminary briefly. I worked for some magazines in New York. I went back to graduate school and got a degree in journalism up in New York City where we lived. In Columbia? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, got ma I went back to the Philippines and got married before that. Uh, and then we came back and I started getting into journalism, worked for the newspaper mm -hmm. uh, as a reporter, the Ledger, and then the St. Pete Times covering cops for both. Uh, papers. Well, uh, all the while, were you taking photographs? Yes, I started taking pictures when I got out of journalism school and was jobless because the evening papers were starting to drop off, so mm -hmm. it was very hard to get a job. Okay. So uh, we already had a child and we were just making ends meet and to keep busy I just started a dark room. Spent more money, that made a lot of sense, <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the bathroom there, you know, portable dark room and started take, taking pictures of my daughter. Uh, and, you know, basically I had got my first 35 millimeter camera just uh, about a year before, but I didn't like the way the color came back. You know, I didn't envision it that way, so I got into black and white. And uh, it was kind of like a science project, and at the same time, I liked shooting people. Mm -hmm. And so I was shooting neighborhood kids and my daughter and things like that. And just always did it as a kind of a hobby passion. So when I was at the newspaper, I took advantage of the darkroom if they had it and learned from the photographers. And this was all in film at that time. Uh, and then uh, I quit the St. Pete Times in around 1986, mm -hmm. went to work for myself in the construction industry. Then when that slowed down in 2007, went back to nursing school. And so I work as a home health nurse now. Well, it, you have had a lot of human contact, which is yeah. probably a very good preparation for this. How did you approach the project? If, if, uh, if, you, were, if you felt that your uh, object was to get the sense of what uh, you know, 2012 was like in Tampa, how, where did you begin? I just looked at the work. I'd always done the work, in a sense, for myself. You know, portraits, what I like. So I said, that's what I'll do. I'll shoot people. And I had had enough shows where people said these are very intimate or very faces. So I thought shooting intimate portraits of the diversity of people in Tampa would be something that I would try and do. And at first I made a list of, you know, I was running around a little too much. It wasn't um, working out as well. And then I just kind of calmed down and realized, well, I know this person in Tampa and they know me and they know the work. And so even if I didn't shoot that person, they might say, I know this musician or I know this someone who just had a child, and so I would go from one to the other. Uh, so the first few weeks were kind of hard because 50 images was overwhelming to me. But, was uh, that the minimum? Well, that was the goal, yeah. Uh -huh. okay. So, and uh, if you come up with 10 good images in a year, shooting all year, I think you're doing well. That's kind of what photographers say. Absolutely. So it pushed me to, to do better, so I just tried to do the best that I could at it. Well, let's start with the, 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 the female police cadets. Mm -hmm. um, now, how did, did, did you know that they were new to the job? Well, at that moment I did, but uh -huh. I had, and that was from the beginning, you know, Robin gave me a list of contacts and things like that, and I contacted the police department, and they said I could ride along with an officer. Uh, so I rode along with a, a female officer, and she was very helpful, and I got to know her throughout the day, and she was always on the, uh, the radio or the phone with her supervisor and there was an inductee ceremony at I believe it's called the Reagan, the Reagan Center. And so I went there and there were these there were new recruits that were just being sworn in by uh, police chief Castor. So as they came out I had the idea for that photograph and I had seen her before the one in front mm -hmm. with the very um, uh, light skin, the Scottish Irish looking yeah. woman you know. So you know how the light's going to look and things like that, and they had dark uniforms and the badges would reflect. So I kind of had this vision, and the, the officer that I was with, she was very helpful. And on the way out, I said, could you line them up like bowling pins right here where the light is, which was in the doorway coming out, so it was soft light. Mm -hmm. And because uh, everything's under natural light that I shoot. It is. Yeah. Oh, and because her face is really illuminated. Yeah, and then so she stood out, so I knew she what I wanted, but I knew... And I blurred the background, but enough so that people would know what's, you know, it's, it's new officers or police officers. So that's how that one started. There look like quite a few. It looked like about maybe eight or so. I think 
maybe six or eight? Yeah, there were at least eight. Maybe it might maybe have been more. more. Well, since our police chief is Jane Castor, <laughs> it, it, she, she probably is making a, a very good role model for a lot of people. You, you did provide a list. Uh, that's a very good idea. Um, when, what are some of the other places that you suggested? Because there were, there are other images of individuals. Um, one of which uh, it, it has, is has a headscarf, uh, and she may be um, Indian. She may be. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what she may be. Yeah, she's, uh, she's just come from. Uh, Palestine, or she was a naturalized Palestinian immigrant, okay. and I didn't know what I was going to shoot that day, but I just got mm -hmm. an idea to go to the uh, to the naturalization immigration office, right. and they told me to come back on April 13th, real early in the morning, in order to get permission to get in. And when I came back, I guess they had really checked me out security-wise, because <laughs> they knew who I was. I didn't take out any card or anything, and they just uh -huh. let me in. So they were they were uh, naturalizing a bunch of. Uh, uh, people had emigrated from other countries right and I shot some different people and I saw her coming in but the husband was waiting outside with a child so I started talking to him and I told him about the project and I said I'd really like to photograph your wife I assume mm -hmm. it's your wife and he said I'll ask her and oh, that's very nice <laughs> yeah afterwards I shot some other people and they took off and then I went downstairs and he said she said no but then she turned to me I think she felt sorry for me or something she <laughs> said she said yes uh, and so we went across the street where there was a background right. of uh, black plywood right across the street from the, I guess it's the immigration office or whatever they call it. Oh, well, that's interesting. Getting permission is, is, must be part of the, of the whole um, project. It is, yeah. Yeah, and a necessary one. There was one of a, a very young girl with many, many braids coming down, and she, she has the most soulful look. I can imagine she's sort of almost like peeking out from a curtain. That's, yeah, that's an old, older photograph, you know, as part of portfolio that I submitted. Ah, that's a but good one, too. <clears throat> in all cases, it's the relationship with the person. It's a 50-50 kind of deal. Mm -hmm. Like with the uh, naturalized Palestinian woman, she said yes, and that was really 50% of the photograph once she said okay. So that's what I learned early on, to find people that said, okay, I want to be photographed, and I don't mind. And so then you have a large part of the trust already there right. uh, and then you try and relax them or, or, or whatever mm -hmm. so that's a it's a big part of it it's a 50 50 collaboration because you know, I'm not just taking one one photograph I might take uh, a whole roll or try and do as many as I can to catch right. that one moment everybody has different approaches I, I can remember Suzanne Cam Crosby uh, who is has always been inventive uh, and she's puts little boats. I think she had the little boat, a mascot, uh, one of mm -hmm. Henry Plant's, I think on the balustrade of, of Bayshore, uh, facing the, the bay, and, um, and it's playful. Uh, yours are, uh, at least the ones I've seen so far, are, are very serious. What other kinds of um, images did you do? Were they, was there always a human in them? Um, yes, there was always a human. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, some of them, are, they are uh, laughing or moving around, and there might be some blur, and I like those, but they have to be natural. Uh -huh. Actually, uh, when I shot uh, Judge uh, Salcinas, yes. there were a lot of serious poses, and one where he had a gavel on his hand, and it looked like uh, the Perry Mason shot from TV <laughs> with the music in the background, yeah, very right. serious and stern. Right. But I like the one where he had a little uh, smirk on his face and he was smiling. And right. you're really shooting just an emotion that's in you when it matches and when it comes naturally. But uh -huh. uh, I, I guess I look at them as I just like the serious ones because I want people to be able to look into their eyes like 100 years from now. Uh -huh. I'm really thinking in, in those terms of um, after the people are dead. I guess it sounds really morbid, but that's because I was always fascinated in textbooks, school books, things like that as a child, to be able to like, look at a portrait of, say, Abraham Lincoln looking back at the camera. And it's, it's as close as I could get to the person. I, I, 
I found that fascinating, the, that the well, eye contact. Well, you certainly have a lot. There's a young girl who is sort of leaning against a, a young woman, I should say, very delicate features, and she's leaning against a door and uh, looks could be either waiting for someone or possibly trying to anticipate someone's uh, presence so she can leave. <laughs> that, it's sort of that, that kind of look where it's very hard to, to decipher. Um, and uh, have you ever had a, uh, a situation in which uh, it didn't turn out quite as you expected? Well, all of them, yeah. yeah. <laughs> all of them. <laughs> you shoot a lot of film. Yeah. And, and, and the surprising thing is uh, sometimes you, you, you want this control mm -hmm. and you think it's going to come out good and then the other thing worked out better and so what I've learned, I, I think I don't, I don't think I would have done as good a job, have done the job as well if I had done it when I was younger because I'm more um, apt to go with the flow now mm -hmm. and then when I see something, you know, go go with that and it works. It happens really quick but you might see a negative and all of a sudden that's the one and not the other one. There's, there's a lot of, for every shot there's 70 or 80 shots that were... Ah, so for your 50 you have how many? Maybe hundreds? I shot 160 rolls of film, wow. approximately 35 millimeters, 36 shots and on the the square format, two and a quarter camera, there's 12 shots so I shot a lot of photographs you bet. and then had to print them all. And you developed them yourself. I developed and then printed mm -hmm. little um, contacts so that I, I mean little uh, five by sevens mm -hmm. to live with them a little, see what I like. And then oh. I kind of self-edited them, my wife would look at them, Robin would look at them, I would send them digitally and mm -hmm. um, try and pick the ones that are, that are, that are good. Mm -hmm. and then some got dropped out that you thought were good at the beginning and then... They reappeared. You, yeah. <laughs> Robin, you've had many, many different styles. Uh, can you give us an idea of what the variety has been? And where, uh, can people see them on the website? Yes, all of the uh, images are on the website. Uh, one of the things that we've, I guess, started out early with um, artists who were photographers and then photographers who were also function as photojournalists. So the approaches, as, as you mentioned, uh, vary a lot. And it's been, some of them have looked at uh, events. That was our photo laureate uh, a few years ago, Barbara Jo Ravel, and others have uh, done portraits, color portraits. But this is the first time we've really had uh, black and white portraits, which we've really needed for a very long time. Right. Yeah. And the Rick, body of Rick's uh, portfolio is just in incredibly well, it's a combination between beautifully diverse and, and, and very, very thoughtful. It's, it's just really a uh, very holistic and, and complete portfolio. It's really beautiful. What are your instructions to the photographer laureate? That the emphasis should be on this rather than that, or do you give that? It's a process. It's a give and take. It's a dialogue. When, and, and we've had to refine it. I mean, we've, we've it's been a process, a learning process for us as well. I mean, each year it gets a little bit better because we learn uh, the photographer laureates, for one thing, give us feedback in terms of how we can improve and what we can do in terms of management and direction and that type of thing. Really, when the uh, photographers submit their ideas or their concepts, proposals, that's the starting off point. That's the beginning. And the jury selects them based on that type of information and on uh, the existing work. Uh, and then we just go back and forth because it's got to be a win-win for everybody. Right. And now you're giving um, other art committees um, a talk, telling them how your project went. We've received a lot of calls across the country from cities wanting to start photographer laureate programs and, and programs that are similar. I'm not quite sure why they're having such challenges. Well, I do know why, actually. I can tell you why they have challenges, because there's a lot of issues to overcome. Like and why? Well, technology is one, as you had mentioned earlier. Right. Uh, the scope of service, how do you set it up? How do you fund it, in many cases? And we have the ability through um, to pool funds and how the ordinance works and that type of thing financially. So we're able to fund it. It's a commitment of the Public Art Committee. Um, so we're able to just make sure that those funds are always there, and the mayor's been very supportive of it as well. So, um, and, and other cities aren't quite so fortunate mm -hmm. with that type of support. And how about lights on Tampa? 
Lights on Tampa has started in 2006. It's been a wonderful catalyst for uh, new development and trying to bring in, again, it's being very responsive to the technology in the area, as well as um, artists working with elements of light in some capacity. There's one, Rick, there's one photograph of a man with white hair that sort of uh, reminds me of uh, the great Lebowski <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> But he has a sort of, I think it's a band. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and he has a kind of a, a, a tutorial f hand raised. Uh, is that part of the yes, series? Yes, yes. Yeah, that was shot in Ybor City. And uh, that was someone that uh, teaches uh, sculpt sculpting, you know, at the community college. And he, I told him about the project. And he kept giving me suggestions of who I should shoot, these different people. And some of them are well-known people, you know, CEOs of local companies that are well-known. And mm -hmm. um, I wasn't getting a good response. And then one day I just said, why don't I just shoot you? Because uh, <laughs> I was really getting tired of all the suggestions that weren't panning out. Right. And uh, he said, really, me? And he was so, uh, I met him there in Ybor City right. and used the dark background of the, of the wall, you mm -hmm. know, in the shade there. And, Took a several a couple of roles of him. What other locales did you visit? Well, there was Ybor City. There was downtown. Uh, it was a little hard downtown because the Republican National Convention was coming up. So I kept getting ah, stopped yes. by uh, sure. different secret right. agents or whatever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I, you know, got away from any kind of street shot things, and I was really trying to do the portraits. So I started really making appointments and go to like with. The judge, I went to where he wanted to meet, and... Um, it was his office, I take it? I, it was mm -hmm. um, where he teaches up there, the, oh, um, the law school. Stetson? Oh, Stet yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and everybody knew him up there, right. so it was, it was like walking around with the president, and I, would, <laughs> I said, let's go in this room, and I saw some light, and that's, that's what we did. Well, you know, he's a, he's a great historian of yeah, Tampa's he, we, background, and he, and he does look professorial. To see him as relaxed as that is wonderful, and it reminds me of the only time I saw him as relaxed and smiling, not that I've seen him a lot, but uh, was at, he was on the panel of uh, the, the best Cuban sandwich. <laughs> it was a, a, like a seminar, and, uh, and it had not only the judge, but it had a member of the Tampa City Council who actually debated the mayor of, of Miami. Who had, and the mayor finally had to yield to the fact that Tampa had the best Cuban sandwich. I'm not sure how she did it, but it, it was very amusing and funny. So uh, you have captured him in a kind of a, a rare, relaxed yeah, we moment. we spent quite a bit of time with him, and then yeah. my wife was with me, and actually he took us to lunch afterwards ah. at uh, one of the Cuban cafes mm -hmm. and, and knew people, and uh, he, was, he was quite a guy. Uh, yeah. Well, he is. He yeah. is. He is. Hey, has a great storehouse of knowledge. Uh, one of yours is, is of a, almost, it could be a fashion shot. It's a, a woman with very dark hair, which is sort of uh, blown across her face, and she has a sort of a camisole type um, a, a top on. And it, was she a part of your, that or was that no, part that of your background? That was part shooting? of the portfolio, and uh -huh. uh, that was actually uh, an Italian woman that was her, her grandmother lived on, on the street that we, where we bought our first house, where we are now. Mm -hmm. And she actually brought her to my house and said, I want you to take some pictures of my granddaughter. Uh -huh. she, she knew me. And uh, she had some idea of modeling pictures. So I went to the beach with her. And none of them were any good, but that was that one particular. It's very good. Yeah. And, it, and it looks like a modeling shop. It's very nice. It actually has a little bit more, not, not humanity, but not as posed, but very attractive. Well, that one, attractive. yeah. Are you going to continue this uh, as a sideline? Have you some reason to uh, maybe take photography as a main uh, avenue of a career? Well, it's an expression of emotion. I think that's why I always enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of, I guess I get happiness from the process of doing it. That's why I like the dark room. It's the, it's the work and everything. It's just that you in the picture. <laughs> I think so. It's very intimate yeah. there in the dark room with the music. And so as, as opportunities come up, I just have to push myself. That was what was really nice about having the project. It's half of myself is you can't stand the pressure, and the other half, it, you need some stress to push you forward, uh, just not too much. So right. I, I'd like to be able to uh, keep doing it. 
as it comes up, and then I can e extend it. And, and that's what was good about this project. I didn't travel anywhere because usually most of the other pictures were taken when we had a vacation somewhere and I had time to shoot. Sure. And this made me shoot all the time, and that was... It was good. It's good, yeah. You need, you need the push. Everyone needs a push. Robin, can anyone attend the opening of the... Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's, this is the gallery down on Tampa Street. Yes, is it not? yes. Ar American Ar uh, Institute of Architecture. Yes. And when, when will we next see Light on Tampa? We're looking at January or February of 2014, and that initiative will probably include, we hope, uh, pending funding, lighting the rest of the bridges. Oh, how wonderful. You know, the 2014 will be the 100th anniversary of the library. Oh, wow. Yes. Um, they had the first library, uh, Andrew Carnegie Library, was not in Tampa. It was in West Tampa. West Tampa at one point was quite apart from Tampa. And then I think a couple of years later, Tampa got its Carnegie Library, which is the one which is no longer used. It's a free library, right? It's Yes. Yeah. yeah always and as a matter of fact the library in this community uh, this uh, is, is really the uh, functions as a town center for so many places which don't have downtowns like downtown Tampa does uh, and uh, one of them as a matter of fact got a, a codicil in a will by a man who knew it was so important to the well-being of the people who lived in that area that he thought it should have an art laboratory. And a woman who was, uh, attended, an honor student from the Rhode Island School of Art and Design is the teacher there, Corey Wright, who also is a sidewalk artist, too, along with her son. So it, it's very interesting how these things connect with one another uh, from here, there, and everywhere. At any rate, uh, we are almost at the end of our show. Make it a point to go and see some of Rick Savage's very marvelous portraits. They give you a very vivid sense of the great diversity there is in this city. And thanks for listening.